With that brief unveiling of our images, uh, I'd like to now start the part of the press conference where we're going to get some scientists to talk about what they mean. Uh, with me on this panel are four distinguished scientists, but they represent hundreds of scientists, engineers, astronauts, and other support people that have worked diligently over the last 30 years to keep Hubble working at its peak efficiency. Now I'd like to introduce them. On my far right, and from the University of Virginia, is Dr. Bob O'Connell, Chair of the Science Oversight Committee for the Wide Field Camera 3, one of our new instruments. To my immediate right is Dr. James Green, Cosmic Origin Spectrograph Principal Investigator from the University of Colorado in Boulder. On my immediate left is Dr. Dave LaCrone, a 30-year veteran of Hubble, like myself. He's Goddard's Senior Project Scientist for Hubble in Greenbelt, Maryland. And on my far left is Dr. Heidi Hamill, Senior Research Scientist at the Space Science Institute, also in Boulder, Colorado. Before I hand over the mic, I'd like to say a few words. First, I've been with the Hubble program for about 30 years and have watched the program mature quite a bit. As many of you know, all of the servicing missions were filled with edge-of-the-seat excitement. The world watched as our astronaut teams, some 32 astronauts, individual astronauts over the years, worked, to, worked their magic to keep Hubble alive. And none was more exciting than the last servicing mission, number four, which is actually number five, but we won't get into that. Uh, the astronaut team, led by Scott Scooter uh, Altman, installed two new instruments. What was most amazing to me was repaired two instruments that were dead, literally dead. And they took them apart, put some new circuit boards in, put it back together again, after how many hundreds of screws, and somehow they brought them alive. I, as I told some reporter this morning, if they had just fixed one of them, I would have been amazed. They fixed both of them, and you'll see some of that data today. And they replaced gyros, batteries, blankets, and other odds and ends, for good measure. Bottom line, these professionals left Hubble as a new state-of-the-art telescope. This is the fifth time now, new beginning. This is the fifth time we've had a new telescope up there, capable of continuing its historic scientific journey for at least five more years, and I will bet a long time after that. I was telling a reporter this morning that I'm not good at predictions because I was up here many years ago predicting that spirit and opportunity would last three months. And that was five years ago. So, so as you saw in the unveiling, the instruments aboard Hubble are capable of taking amazing images, and the world stands ready to see what we can do from this point on. And let there be no doubt that this is truly a Hubble's new beginning. With that, we'll turn to Bob to tell us what he's got. <clears throat> Thanks, Ed. Uh, let me first say that we couldn't be happier about the way things have gone. You recall the installation of the wide field camera was a little touch and go, but I'm happy to say it's working beautifully at the moment. It's working even a little better than we expected. Right now, it's scheduled to be used in half of all the Hubble observations over the next year, and we think a larger fraction over the next five years. So we really want to thank the wonderful crew of Atlantis for what they did for us, and especially uh, John and Drew. I think it's safe to say that never have so many scientists owed so much to two guys who fixed a stuck bolt. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, we have four pictures for you today. Uh, we're going to show these in order from old age to youth, but it's good to keep in mind that astronomers think that something is a, that's a million years old is young. So let's start with the first picture. Um, this is a picture of a gigantic star cluster in our own galaxy. It's called Omega Centauri. It contains about 10 million stars, and we're only seeing a very small piece of it here. Uh, these are all old stars. They're about twice as old as the sun. And uh, you can see they fall into three different color classes. They're gold stars, and in fact, most of the stars in the image are gold, and that's the color of the sun. But then there are very blue stars, and there are very red ones. Now, the color contrast here is real, and it's picked up by our camera. Uh, the blue stars are very hot. They emit Lot, most of their light in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. That's one of the new bands we have on the camera. Uh, but very little in the red band. And the, the cool stars are just the opposite. They emit a lot of light in the red band, but very little in the ultraviolet. So just by looking at the colors of the stars in this kind of picture, you can sort them by temperature. And in this particular case, it also means sorting them by evolutionary state because the temperature differences here are caused by differences in the internal structure of these stars and in the kinds of fuels they're burning deep inside of them. So by studying pictures like this, we learn about the physics of stars as they approach very, very old age. 
Now the second picture is called the Butterfly Nebula for obvious reasons. It looks like a butterfly. 